Where does space actually begin? This question might seem simple at first glance, but it's a topic of heated debate among experts. Indeed, defining the boundary between Earth and space is a complex endeavor. The invisible line separating our planet from the cosmos isn't as clear-cut as one might imagine. The suggestions for this boundary span a staggering range from as close as 18 and a half miles to as far as over a million miles away. Unfathomable distances that truly underscore the vastness of the universe we're a part of. This diversity of opinion reflects the intricacies and nuances of understanding space. It's a frontier we're still exploring, a realm of endless possibilities and unanswered questions. And one of those questions is the subject of our discourse today. Where exactly does space begin? But amidst the myriad of suggestions, one boundary has gained more acceptance than the rest. It's a boundary that has been recognized by the United Nations and the US government, a boundary named after a pioneer in aerospace and the subject of our next scene. But there is one boundary that is more widely accepted than others. It's called the Kármán Line. The Kármán Line, named after Theodor von Kármán, a Hungarian-born aerospace pioneer, is considered the boundary of space. But why? Well, the Kármán Line is based on the altitude where traditional aircraft can no longer effectively fly. This is due to the thinness of the atmosphere at this height, which makes it impossible for an aircraft to gain lift from air pressure. Imagine trying to flap your wings where there's barely any air. Theodor von Kármán calculated this altitude, determining where the Earth's atmosphere becomes so thin that conventional aviation becomes impossible. And this is not a random point somewhere in the sky. It is approximately 52 miles above the ground, marking the boundary between our planet's atmosphere and the vast expanse of space. This boundary, known as the Kármán Line, is recognized by prominent organizations such as the United Nations and the U.S. government. It's a significant marker, not just for pilots and astronauts, but for the entire world. For example, when we talk about space exploration or satellite launch, we refer to this line. Now you might be wondering, why is it called a line? Well, it's not a physical line that you can see or touch. It's an imaginary boundary, a point of transition from the breathable atmosphere to the vacuum of space. It's the line that distinguishes aeronautics, the study of flight within Earth's atmosphere, from astronautics, the study of movement in space. But here's a fascinating twist. The Kármán line is not a universally accepted standard. While it is widely recognized, there's a fair amount of debate among experts about where exactly space begins. Some argue for a lower boundary, others for a higher one. The truth is the boundary of space is not a sharp line, but a gradual transition. Interestingly, the Kármán line is considered a folk theorem. Let's explore why. Despite its widespread acceptance, the Kármán line is considered a folk theorem. Now, you might be wondering why such a significant boundary bears this label. Well, the answer lies in the lineage of its publication. Surprisingly, it was not Theodore von Kármán, the namesake of the Kármán line who published this definition. Instead, it was Andrew Gallagher Haley, known as the world's first practitioner of space law. Haley was a visionary, a man who dared to think about the legal implications of space exploration before others even considered it a possibility. Haley did more than just adopt von Kármán's calculations, he refined them. He determined that the actual boundary of space is around 52 miles above the ground, corresponding to a layer of our atmosphere known as the mesopause. The mesopause is the region where the temperature drops to its absolute minimum. It's a stark, cold boundary, a fitting gateway to the infinite expanse beyond. But why did Haley choose the mesopause? The reason is as much practical as it is symbolic. At this altitude, traditional aircraft can no longer effectively fly due to the thinness of the atmosphere. It marks a clear transition from air to space, from the familiar to the unknown. However, despite Haley's careful calculations and the widespread acceptance of the Kármán line, there's still some debate about the exact boundary of space. Some experts argue for a return to the original definition of approximately 50 miles, they believe this is more accurate and aligns with the Air Force's criteria for awarding astronaut wings. This leads us to the question, should the definition of the boundary of space be revisited? Some experts argue for a return to the original definition of approximately 50 miles. 
This is where we find ourselves now, at a crossroads of sorts, with a growing chorus of voices challenging the established boundary of space. Why 50 miles, you may ask? It's not an arbitrary number plucked from the ether, but rather a figure that aligns with the United States Air Force's criteria for awarding astronaut wings. The Air Force, a significant player in the field of aerospace, considers any flight that exceeds 50 miles in altitude as a mission into space. This perspective lends weight to the argument for revisiting the boundary of space. The idea is to redraw the line to shift our understanding of where Earth's atmosphere ends and the infinite expanse of space begins. It's a challenge to the status quo, a call to reevaluate the boundary that has been recognized by international bodies like the United Nations and accepted by the global community. But why does this matter? Why is there a need for this revision? Well, it's about more than just a matter of miles. It's about the recognition of human achievements in space exploration. It's about the men and women who brave the unknown, who risk everything to push the boundaries of what's possible. By aligning the boundary of space with the Air Force's criteria, we acknowledge their courage and their contributions to our collective understanding of the universe. At the heart of this debate is a desire for accuracy, for a definition that reflects our evolving knowledge of the cosmos. It's an invitation to question, to explore, to refine our understanding of the universe we inhabit. It's a reminder that in the realm of space exploration, there's always room for discovery, for new perspectives, and for change. But von Karman had another proposal, one that has implications beyond the realm of physics. Von Karman suggested that the boundary of space should also be a jurisdictional boundary. Now, what does this mean? Well, in simple terms, von Karman proposed that the space directly above a country up to the boundary of the Karman line should belong to that country. So, for instance, the space directly above the United States up to around 52 miles high would be U.S. territory. Beyond that line, space would be free and open to all. But why did von Karman propose this idea? Essentially, it was an attempt to bring some order to the potentially chaotic world of space exploration and colonization. By assigning each country a portion of space, it would prevent conflicts over territory and resources in the future. This idea has significant implications in terms of space law and international relations. If the space above a country is considered part of that country's territory, then any unauthorized entry into that space could be considered an act of trespass or even aggression. This could lead to diplomatic incidents or even wars. On the other hand, if space is free and open to all beyond the Karman line, it raises the question of who has the right to exploit the resources of space. Could any country or any private company simply send up a spaceship and start mining asteroids for valuable minerals? And who would have the authority to stop them if they did? These are complicated questions, and there are no easy answers. But what is clear is that, as we venture deeper into space, we will need to establish clear rules and regulations to govern our activities. We will need to balance the rights of individual countries with the need for international cooperation and mutual respect. So, where does space begin? It seems the answer is not just a matter of physics, but also of law and politics. In this journey, we've explored the intriguing question of where space begins. We've delved into the debate surrounding the boundary of Earth and space, a topic that even experts find contentious. We've learned about the Karman Line, the widely accepted threshold of space, named after the Hungarian-born aerospace pioneer Theodor von Karman. We've also touched on the folk theorem, an interesting concept not published by von Karman himself, but by Andrew Gallagher Haley, the world's first practitioner of space law. Haley's calculations suggest that the actual boundary of space might actually be closer to Earth, around 52 miles above ground. In addition, we've pondered the implications of this boundary on space law and international relations. Von Karman proposed the idea that the boundary of space should also serve as a jurisdictional boundary, with each country owning the space below the line and the rest being free space. While we may not have a definitive answer, one thing is clear, the question of where space begins is a fascinating one, full of complexity and intrigue. So next time you look up at the sky, remember, 
space might be closer than you 